Dzień dobry, jest dzisiaj z nami Mark, który zgodził się na wywiad. Mark jest Addiction Recovery Coach, czyli jest coachem, który pracuje z osobami uzależnionymi, szczególnie z mężczyznami uzależnionymi od seksu i doświadczającymi, czy dość, mężczyznami, którzy doświadczyli traumy. Spotkałam Marka kilka lat temu na szkoleniu w Anglii i Mark zgodził się dzisiaj z nami porozmawiać o tym, czym jest uzależnienie od seksu i jaką drogę on sam przebył. Hi Mark, it's really nice to see you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I didn't understand a word of that, but I'm... I... Don't worry. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm really glad you agreed on uh, to do, talk to me on this uh, talk on this subject and uh, I will uh, begin with the with the question how would you uh, how would you define what sex addiction is how would I define what sex addiction is do you know there are many people in my industry who who still doubt or even try to convince others that sex addiction doesn't even exist It's, it's, a, it's an interesting and sometimes hotly debated topic. I do believe it exists. I think there are more people that do than don't. I don't care whether you call it sex addiction or compulsive sexual behavior or problematic sexual behavior. It doesn't matter to me. I think what matters is, the, is recognizing that um, sex, sex is a behavior. So is eating so is shopping, so is exercise. They are all or can all become a recognized addiction if you are using it compulsively. And one of the ways to, one of the most interesting things I, I have learned myself and I use with my clients, if someone wants to know whether something is an addiction, I say, well, how about this? Try stopping it. Just, just try not doing it for a week, two weeks and see what happens. And what tends to be very interesting is if someone does try and stop it, all the emotions and the feelings and the difficult, the difficult things that they have going on inside themselves that they may have been suppressing or avoiding by doing whatever behavior they're doing, whether it's sex or gambling or dis dysfunctional eating, when you stop those behaviors, the feelings appear they come to the surface and they sometimes are so painful that then you have to, you can't stop what your what your addiction mm. and so of course that's when it when it, that's a very good indicator that it has become a necessary compulsion in your life with sex a lot of people hear the words sex addiction and some movies have even made jokes about it and they think that it just means oh you must be getting a lot of sex Well, sadly, sometimes that is very far from the truth. Sex addiction is not even necessarily about actual intercourse. It, it so often includes things like pornography, um, dangerous behaviors like touching, like, so for example, a man getting onto a bus and inappropriately touching another person, which is called, there's a name for that. It's actually called frottage, um, going into a public park and exposing yourself. This is all recognized as something that is done compulsively because you have a need to, to, to expose yourself, to gain, to be seen and to be heard. Sex addiction is very much about getting your needs met, which were not met as a child. And the most common needs which are not met as a child, if you are in a dysfunctional family, is that you're not seen, not truly seen, and you're not heard, you're not accepted. By your parents or, or, or whoever is raising you. So you, you develop this need to be seen, to be heard, maybe to be touched. And so, of course, what better addiction uh, out of all of the addictions to get your, your being seen, being heard, being touched needs met than to do something that is one of the most, one of the most stimulating and basic, basic needs of, of our human beings, which is sex. But of course, tragically, what tends, to, what tends to happen with sex addiction is that you can end up sitting on a computer for five, six, even 10 hours a day searching for pornography. This is what happens. This is the reality. People risk their jobs by surfing pornography on office computers. 
and then get get um, get found out when the when the computer gets a virus or something like that. Sex addiction is actually one of the most lonely and debilitating addictions because of the stigma. People don't want to talk about it. No one wants to admit that they're surfing um, dangerous pornography or crazy pornography, or you don't go to a you don't go to a party or discuss with your best friend that you're st sitting at your computer for three hours every night when you should be with your wife and children staring at pornography, or worse, going to see prostitutes behind your wife's back or whatever you're doing. No one wants to talk about this. If you walk into a drinks party or a dinner party and you, someone offers you a drink and you say, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't drink. I, I, I have a problem with alcohol. You get someone says, well, congratulations. That's really amazing. But if someone turns to you and says something about sex and you say, oh, no, I have a problem with sex. They don't look at you and congratulate you. They look at you as if you're strange or worse. They look at you as if you're weird. So the whole stigma around even talking about sex makes exploring the difficulties of sex addiction or any form of compulsive sexual behavior incredibly hard and is why it's why people suffer with it sometimes for so long because they don't know who to talk to and they're too frightened so i hope that gives some in some sort of insight into the tragic loneliness of sex addiction i, I could talk for days about what sex addiction is in terms of some of the things that people do but i hope i've given you a little mm -hmm. little in a uh, little window into what what, what, what it is. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that was very powerful. Thank you, Mark. Um, you mentioned about this uh, unmet needs of the child. Could you, yeah. uh, could you tell us something more about the roots of sex addiction, how you understand it? Yes, well, the best thing I can do is, is describe my own, part of my own story to help, because working with the men I work with, I've come to realize that my story is actually very common amongst people struggling with sex addiction. When I was a young boy, I was, I was born into quite a wealthy family and, and I'm 53 years of age. So half a century ago, it was very traditional in, in my kind of a family for mothers to give their children to nannies. Unfortunately, my nanny was abusive and she beat me regularly. She physically attacked me on a regular basis. So I learned to fear the world before I could even walk. What that left, and, and it, also, it also took me away from my mother. My mother didn't hold me much as a baby because she gave me to this nanny. So I, I, what, what was happening inside me was I was growing this anger, this rage towards women, which is very tragic and very sad. I can talk about it today, but it, it took me a long time to even understand this. When, when, you, when, you're, when you don't attach healthfully to, a, to your parents, or worse, when you're being physically beaten and abused by someone that isn't your parent. You, you have no attachment. The whole, uh, whole area of attachment theory, which started in the 60s, is, 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 is a, a whole area of psychology well worth looking into. But being attached to your parent is very important. If you're not, you will look for your needs to be met, your needs for touch, for softness, for intimacy, for hugs, for, for unconditional love, you will look for them to be met elsewhere yeah. because that's what humans do. We go looking for to have our needs met and all humans need to be touched and hugged and, and, and to be nurtured, especially as children. When you're not, you go looking for it elsewhere. And when you're on top of that, if you're being abused and, you're, and I got sent away to a very un, unpleasant British boarding schools at the age of eight, it was traditional to do it in those days if you could afford it. Some people still personally agree with boarding schools but that's just my opinion unfortunately when i got to a boarding school i was very badly bullied which included um, a physical assault a sexual molestation on one occasion and um, li living a very frightened life <clears throat> for about two, two or three years uh, over the ages of eight nine and ten that left me very frightened and what i believe turned the page into sex addiction for me was the very first time I learned to masturbate. There's a, there's a saying, we all have millions and millions of neurons in our brain. And when one, uh, there's a saying that says neurons that, that fire together, that get activated together, they end up getting wired together. So if that's a neuron, this is a neuron, and they both get triggered at the same time, they end up joining like that. And I was having neurons being triggered by the pain I was receiving. 
And then I learned to give myself pleasure by masturbating. I remember it very well, aged 11. I can remember to this day, the very first time I masturbated and thought, this feels amazing. But the problem was, because I was, having, I was, I was re receiving a lot of pain in my life at the time, I learned that this pleasure, masturbation, could take away this pain, the pain and fear of other boys of life. And so unfortunately, the, 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 my pleasure and pain centers of my brain got very confused. And so I learned that sex, initially with myself, and then as I became a teenager with other people, could take away any pain, any fears that I was having to face in life, which of course is a very unhealthy way of dealing with pain and fear. So this is how I became, I, that is, this is how and why I started to use sex, and I emphasize the word use, to make me feel better. It's all, addiction, I believe addiction is all about feelings. We all have, we all have to learn to process emotions and feelings. And if we learn how to do that, because they are, uh, they are mirrored healthily by parents at a young age, then we learn how to process and show our feelings. But if you are born into a family where, where you're not allowed to show your feelings, where if you, if you get too emotional, the father says, stop that crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. Or if, if your mother says something similar, if you learn that it is not safe in your family to show it emotions and feelings, you will suppress them. You will bury them inside you. But like a pressure cooker, if you put a pressure cooker on a stove and, and, and seal the lid tight, eventually that pressure cooker will explode. Well, human beings are the same. If you suppress the feelings and emotions, the natural feelings and emotions that we all have, if you suppress them for too long, that energy is gonna, has to come out somewhere. And with me, it came out in sex, desperately needing to be seen and heard and felt and touched and to attach to another human being. And so that's what I believe led me into sex addiction. It, it, it was a perfect way to connect with, with another human being, but, but tragically for all the wrong reasons. And that is why I spent 30 years destroying one relationship after another, because I was using women thinking they were gonna fix me. But unfortunately, that doesn't work. You have to learn to fix yourself to support yourself, to find, you have to learn to healthily express your feelings. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do mm. in certain societies and in certain families. Mm. So how can you fix yourself? Is it possible, Mark? I, I absolutely believe it is possible to recover. I think the word is recover. Fix, mm -hmm. is, yeah. fix can be a dangerous word because of course, in the world of addiction, um, people turn to drugs and alcohol to get a fix. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let's not use the word fix. Let's use the word recover and recovery from any addiction. I think, I think the, 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 the most, one of the most important things to really understand is what, what does recovery mean when used in this term? Well, the word recovery to me means to rediscover something that has been lost. And so when used, it, when, when applied to a human being, to me, it means it meant, it has meant over the last few years, rediscovering me, the me that was born 53 years ago, innocent, vulnerable, fragile, and deserving of love. Every baby that's ever born is born a bundle of joy. Every, every time you look at a baby, all the baby, baby smiles at you, it makes gorgeous noises. You look at this beautiful creature and you see this, this light, this curiosity. All babies want to do is look and be curious and touch and, and, and love. That's all they want to do. And they, they have every right to deserve that love in, in return. Mm -hmm. when, it's not, when it doesn't come, of course, that's when, that's when problems go wrong. And that's when children start to hide themselves because they're too frightened to, to show their true self. So to me, that's where, that's where the problems start. And then as those problems get deeper and deeper, and then you and you grow up into your teenage years and you and you have not learned how to show your feelings and emotions as i was saying earlier that's when addictions start that's when addictions come in because they medicate the difficulty that you're having with your feelings so the whole for me recovery is about learning to express and feel your feelings 
and realize that just because your feelings when you were a baby or when you were a child were genuinely terrifying because of what may have been done to you, those same feelings do not have to control your adult life. The problem is until someone points that out to you, we as human beings, we, we have these ingrained patterns, defensive patterns, things we've learned to do over many years, decades in my case, and they're very hard to break until someone sits you down and helps you see that what you learn to defend yourself against as a child, you no longer have to defend yourself against as an adult, despite the fact your brain at times is telling you so. So to me, recovery is about rediscovering the true essence, the true nature of yourself and realizing that it is finally safe to show yourself, to express yourself, to have your feelings, to feel your feelings, to show your emotions, to be seen and to be heard, and hopefully with someone in your adult life who is able to reciprocate that. Mm. I often uh, came across people uh, at work who uh, hate this vulnerable part of themselves. Uh, so when they come closer, a little bit closer to themselves, they immediately uh, build up this defense wall uh, because they so much they have so much hatred to this part. Uh, I, I don't know whether you experienced that or uh, can you um, can you say how can uh, one uh, deal with this hate hatred toward themselves? Well. Um... What a beautiful question. Thank you. Self-hatred is something that has driven me for tragically for most of my life. When a child is being abused in any way by its parents, it does not learn to hate its parents. It learns to hate itself because a child has no other possible alternative than to, than to tell itself and to, 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 than to believe that whatever a parent is screaming at the child for, it must be the child's fault. Because a child doesn't have the ability to rationalize and say, age five, for example, oh, mummy is just having a bad day. That's not what a child does. It learns to hate itself. And in a family like that, you cannot be vulnerable because if you show a soft, or vulnerable side, it will be humiliated or beaten or attacked or laughed at or ridiculed. This is what happens in dysfunctional families with parents who are themselves in a lot of pain. Unfortunately, society forgets very easily that when you see a child behaving badly or when you see a bully on a playground attacking another child, society tends to look at the child and say, oh, what a bad kid. But hang on a second. No, no seven-year-old goes onto a playground and physically attacks another seven or six or a five-year-old for, for no reason. There must be a reason. And that's where we need to look. And unfortunately, the reason is not the child's fault. It's the parent's fault. You don't, you don't, you, no one is born a bully. No one. No one is born homophobic. No one is born racist. You have to learn these things from someone. And of course, most, most of the time, you learn these from your parents. You learn whatever they hate whatever they don't like, you inherit that. It becomes your norm until you learn to question it. But that may be some years down the line and you may never learn to question mm. it. And that's the problem with our society. And that leads us to, to, to not be vulnerable. And men are taught you can't cry, you can't be weak, to ask for help is weakness. You must do it on your own. I mean, let's not forget, Natalia, your country and mine were at the heart of two world wars. I mean, that actually still is, is, worth, is worth mentioning because what it taught us, it taught us, taught generations of men to be tough, to, be, to not be seen to be weak in any way because otherwise that weakness would be exploited. Well, of course, today, luckily, and pray it never happens again, we're not fighting a world war. We're actually getting up out of bed and going to work and trying to run our life and trying to make money and trying to love and be loved and trying to have a relationship with our wives and our children and pets or whatever you want to have a relationship with. But we have this legacy left over from the last hundred years of men being taught that it is not acceptable to cry, 
You mustn't show your feelings. If you show your feelings, or if you're too gentle, or if you're too feminine, you're not a man. You've got to be a man. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be a man. That is the problem. That's where the problems start when a father turns to a young boy and says, stop crying and be a man. Why? What's wrong with crying? What's wrong with having feelings and emotions? This is the problem. So yes, we learn to hate ourselves if we fear vulnerability. There's an amazing woman in America I'm sure you've heard of called Brene Brown. Yes, she, I have. <laughs> she she, she um, first released her now, she, it's been watched millions of times. There's a YouTube TED talk called The Power of Vulnerability. If you type Brene Brown, The Power of Vulnerability into YouTube, you will find it. It's a 20 minute TED talk. It is absolutely brilliant. It is, it so destroys the myths, the, 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 the poisoned myths around the fact that weakness, that, that vulnerability is weakness. Vulnerability is strength. If you have the courage to turn to a fellow human being that you trust and say, I am struggling, I need help. What do you think of this? You automatically give the person you've turned to permission to show their softer side. And so automatically, you actually end up having a much deeper and much more genuine conversation. It's only when you walk, it's only when you posture and all this modern rubbish of, of, of trying to hide your emotions that people sense it and they feel, they see that you're, you're distant and you're defensive. Well, no one wants to get close to someone that's defensive. It's not natural. You want to talk to someone if you feel that they're open and vulnerable. So the vulnerability thing is huge. Yeah. And it took me a long time to figure that out. And I lived hating parts of myself, big parts of myself, for decades. I believe I have finally figured out that there's no point in hating parts of myself. I, when I have clients who have this very problem, and a lot of them do, I ask them this question. I say, if, if you're in the kitchen and you're using a knife and you cut your finger, what do you do with your finger? And automatically they say, well, you, you bandage it and you take care of it. And, and, and I say, exactly. You don't cut it off, do you? You can't cut off bits of yourself that get damaged. You have to help them repair. So we do that so naturally with our physical bodies. But why don't we do that with our emotional selves? So when we have a part of ourselves that we don't like, we try and ban it. We try and get, we don't want to see it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, we don't want to feel it. But why not? Because if we nurture ourself, our, our internal self, as easily and as obviously as we nurture a cut finger, we would all be a lot healthier. Mm. Beautiful. Um, I would like to ask you also, Mark, about abstinence. Uh, clients often ask about it and have lots of doubts. Uh, how do you say... Uh, what is abstinence in the recover sex addiction recovery? Is it necessary and um, to what extent? Certainly. Again, beautiful question. Abstinence is a funny thing with sex addiction. Here's, here's, a, here's one really big difference between the behavioral addictions and chemical addictions. So there are, there are two chemical addictions, drugs and alcohol, in all the different varieties. They're known as the chemical addictions because you're putting a chemical inside your body. Every other addiction, by default, is behavioral. So sex addiction is behavior. Um, eating and, and anorexia and bulimia, that's a, that's a behavior. That's an, also an addiction. Exercise is a behavior, but it can also be an addiction. addiction. Mm -hmm. Work is a behavior, but it can also be an addiction, and so on and so on. Problem with the behavioral addictions is that most, most you need to do to have a healthy life. There's one notable exception, gambling is, is a recognized addiction and it's a behavior. You do not need to gamble. No one needs to gamble. So that's, that's one exception. But every other behavioral addiction I can think of, work, exercise, sex, eating, whatever it is, you, you have to do it. You have to eat to have a healthy life. You have to exercise. You have to go to work. And you have to have sex. So abstinence with sex addiction is difficult. It's difficult to, to define. If When you first, let, let's say a man has been living in, in a marriage for 20 years, and suddenly he is discovered 
he's discovered um, using pornography or he's discovered seeing prostitutes or you know, there's a big explosion and finally all his secrets are discovered let's say for example mm -hmm. at that point at the initial time of discovery certainly the the damaging behaviors need to stop so it's easy taking some taking prostitution for example if a man is seeing a prostitute for example behind without his wife's knowledge clearly that needs to stop because that's only going to cause more damage to him to the prostitute and to his wife so that kind of behavior has to stop but you can't long term not have sex with your wife if you want to have a healthy relationship a period of abstinence and a, for example maybe 3 months i think is a good, i think can be a very useful thing because if you have a period of, of, of no sex at all, including masturbation, nothing, then in that period of time, as I said a little earlier in this interview, all the feelings that you have been controlling with your addiction are going to come to the surface. And it's going to be a very, very difficult time. And that's a time when you need a therapist, when you need a coach, when you may need to be in treatment to help you through that very difficult, tough initial time when you stop doing your addiction. During that time, that's when you will explore why you're doing it. There's so much emphasis over the year, over many decades has been put into just stopping it. Mm -hmm. Nancy Reagan's famous slogan decades ago was just say no to drugs. Just say no. That easy, right? Mm. Well, no, it's not that easy. That's the problem. You can't just say no. You can't just stop it overnight. It doesn't work. You have to understand why you're doing something if you're going to if you're going to then choose to stop doing it but you're not going to stop it if it's actually been helping you through life for the last 10 20 30 years unless you understand the why desmond tutu that beautiful man that amazing man he has a very famous quote which i love to use he says we have to just stop pulling people out of the river we have to go upstream and figure out why people are falling in mm. in the first place Addiction, addiction itself is seen by everybody as a huge problem. But what people have to realize is that addiction is actually a symptom of a problem. Addiction is not the key problem. The problem is in here. The problem is in your heart. The problem is in your head. The problem is why are you doing it? That's what you have to understand. So abstinence helps bring all that difficulty out to the surface, but you've got to do it with help. If someone has been looking at pornography for 10 years or seeing prostitutes for 15 years, if they suddenly stop and then try and make it through life, I almost, I predict they're going to get very angry or very depressed. And without professional help, it is a very, very dangerous time. Stopping any addiction for however long, for any period of time, is dangerous to do it without help. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. Uh, can have can sex addict have a healthy sex? After, Absolutely, mm -hmm. I believe they can, Natalia. I think what's one of the most difficult things for sex addicts, and especially if they are in relationship with someone, is that when they are discovered, let's say a wife discovers a husband has been has been using pornography and maybe some dangerous pornography. Maybe he's been doing it for years. And suddenly she discovers it because it comes up on the home computer or something awful happens. Or worse, one of their children opens the computer and the pornography is right there. This is how people get, get caught. And by the way, I am, I, I just, can I just clarify one thing? I am, I do keep saying the husband and the wife, emphasizing the husband as a sex addict. Women do struggle with sex addiction, but because it is, because it is considered so bad by society, very few women are, have the courage to talk about it. So most sex addicts are known to be men because that's who, that's who gets busted. That's who, that's who comes in to help. That's who, that's who ends up in a treatment center seeking help. So I just want to clarify that women mm -hmm. can struggle with sex addiction, but I, it is mostly men that tend to, that, that I certainly help. So yes, I think what has to happen is you, after a period of abstinence, the wife who may be in shock, who may be suffering PTSD, it is now known and accepted psychologically that women suffer PTSD when they discover what husbands or boyfriends have been doing for some time, when their trust 
is destroyed when everything they believed in is, is taken from them by default of the fact that they don't feel enough because of, why would my husband sing, be seeing a prostitute? Surely that must mean I'm not good enough for him. Maybe if I were, wore something sexy tonight, maybe he wouldn't want to see the prostitute. It is nothing to do with the wife. It is all to do with what is going on inside the husband. And this is something that society has to start understanding. So to, that's why initially, after the initial discovery, is a very, very difficult time. Obviously, the sex addict is feeling a massive amount of shame, and sometimes it's feeling suicidal. They may have lost their job if they've been, if, if that's what it's come to. And then there's the, then there's the wife who's feeling terrified, frightened, insecure, who to turn to, embarrassed, full of shame herself. Her husband's been doing this, uh, doing these awful things. She might suddenly see him as a monster. There's so many difficult uh, moments you're going to have to go through. If the, if, if the relationship survives and they both get the help they need, and I emphasize both, the, the, the female partners of sex addicts absolutely must get professional help. And the best organization I can recognize, re recommend for that is one based in America called APSATS, which is A-P-S-A-T-S. Um, type AppSats into Google and you'll find them. They're a specialist organiza organization set up by an amazing lady called Barbara Stephens 20 years ago. And they specialize in helping the, the female partners of sex addicts. And that is the best organization who can, and who, can, who can help women who discover what's been going on maybe for 10 years. Once the discovery process has, has, has gone through and you've got the help, absolutely i believe you can have healthy sex and once a man learns that he doesn't have to be aggressive that he that he can be gentle but that his feelings and emotions are safe to express in my experience sex actually gets even better because the in intensity is not intimacy it's something i it's a big mistake i made for decades i thought intimate i thought intensity was intimacy it is not and intensity cannot last because it's like a drug. You need more and more and more. One, one, you do something crazy, and the next time it, that wasn't crazy enough. So you make it even more crazy, and you make it even more crazy. And this is, of course, what leads you to death very often. You do crazy, more and more insane things, and eventually it can kill you. Mm -hmm. Intimacy. Intimacy. I gave a lecture. I, um, I've given a lecture twice this year at two different conferences about intimacy. Intimacy starts here with yourself long before you can safely be intimate with, with another human being. So yes, I do believe that you, a sex addict can end up having better, even better sex, but you've got to do the work, Natalia, mm. and it's not easy. Mm. How long does it take to, to recover it? <laughs> how, 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 long is, how long is the piece of string, Natalia? <laughs> <laughs> I've got long arms. I'm a very tall man. It's, it's, a, it's a journey, Natalia. Every single person is going to be different. I have, I have had some clients who've come to see me for two or three sessions, and, and, and I've been able to help them see things because they were ready to see it. I've had other clients who've been coming who've seen me many, many times, and it takes a lot longer because they're not, they don't, they're not ready inside. They don't want to let go of this of this thing they've been using for so long that makes them feel safe. This is the problem, Natalia. Addiction actually helps on some level or you wouldn't do it. People, people forget that. Sometimes with clients, I ask them to write out a list of the benefits of the addiction. And sometimes they look at me a bit strangely and go, benefits, what benefits? And I go, well, You've been doing this for 20 years. It must have been helping you somehow. And when you actually think about it like that, you get them to, you, it's a brilliant exercise to start helping you understand why you were doing it. So I think, I think it's a very, very powerful thing, a very necessary thing to break the cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So what would you say to a person who is at the beginning of the journey and is at, is at the stage of self-hatred, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, fear, uh, and also at the stage when addiction is really, really strong and really, really helps deal with that? So what, what would I say to someone? Mm -hmm. Well, 
obviously the, 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 when you if you're in if you're feeling so lost so lonely you're in full of self-hatred clearly you need help and what, the only thing i can say to people is you have to ask for help you have to talk to someone about this because you it is i don't believe it is possible to break the cycle and to somehow start start getting healthy on your own but especially in countries which includes yours where the stigma of talking about sex is terrifying you know who wants to who wants to even admit that they're doing some of these things some of which might even be illegal so of course getting help is essential or or, or you or, this is why the largest i think the largest or the second largest group of people who commit suicide in this country, and maybe, I don't know what the statistics are for yours, and in America as well, is men between the age, I forget what the exact, something like between the age of 20 and 40, or there's some terrifyingly large statistic of men, of, 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 of people who kill themselves. And it's men between, between that rough age group. But, and, and you look at why. And the why is because they get so depressed and so lost in their pain in, in, in the newspapers every day. I have a friend of mine, an old school friend, whose son wrote to me literally days ago, it's quite a weird coincidence, asking me to sponsor him because a friend of his killed himself um, six months ago. Young boy, beautiful, I think he was somewhere around the age of 19, killed himself. And everyone was just asking, left asking why? Well, the answer is he, he didn't know who to ask for help and he didn't know how to ask for help. We have to stop treating men as as perpetrators as as criminals just because they have because they show or just because they are incapable of being gentle there is a reason men get become so angry and we have to we, the, the, the change has to be global let alone individual but all i can say to anybody out there that is hurting is you've got to call someone I mean, that's what I do for a living. I, 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 I am there for people to call. If, I, if someone needs the kind of um, deep therapeutic help, I refer them. I, will help, I help people find therapists for nothing. I don't even charge for that because people need to get that help if they're going to break the cycle. So that, that's the best advice I can mm -hmm. give. I know it's a hard thing to do, but all I can do is look into this camera and say, you must ask for help. Thank you so much, Mark. It was really enriching for me and touching. Uh, and I feel like I've learned a lot from you. And I really appreciate your honesty and vulnerability and openness. So um, I'm really, really grateful. Natalia, thank you. It's been it's lovely to reconnect with you after meeting on that course, what was it, four years ago now, I think. Mm. And this is what I do. I, I share my journey to inspire others, to show people that you absolutely can break free of the secrecy and the stigmatic terror mm. of feeling and talking about, of feeling bad and talking about sexual problems. There is help out there. And I love talking about it. If I can inspire one, uh. then I've done a good job. You are inspiring. I think, I mean, it's really powerful what you're saying, uh, because it's, um, you're not saying just what you've learned from books or even from, from the clients, but from your own, you know, from your, up from your heart. Uh, so uh, I think it will help a lot of men. Involved. Well, look, mm -hmm. let, let's keep in touch. And if I can be of, of any further help to you or talk to anybody, or, I, I like, I love talking about this. I, I like talking at, at, at conferences and stuff. Uh -huh. I will talk to anybody to inspire them about how to better understand this and how mm -hmm. to break. Okay. Uh, we are, th we, we are thinking about organizing conference. So in Poland about sex addiction. So uh, I will come back to you. I'd be honored. And let's pray we can pray we can yeah. face to face yeah. and not like this. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm missing hugs and mm. looking people in the eye and having an energy in a room. And I think we're all missing that. Yeah, I miss that too. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Have a good day. That's a, wonderful to see you. Keep safe out there. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.